Hey guys, hope all is well. Um, uh, I'm bringing this video to you super late on uh, on Wednesday night, or I guess Thursday morning now. It's the clock struck midnight about 15 minutes ago. And essentially, I'm going to play the role of chess doctor. Um, uh, again, I got a lot of submissions from you guys, um, different games, and um, I'm, I was really looking forward to analyzing one, so that's going to be what this video is. Um, I just want to say, for future reference, I actually think it would be super awesome if actually uh, uh, the games were submitted to my email instead. I think it would be a little bit easier, so uh, I'll have this in the comments, but casacorley at gmail.com would be really great. And also, it would be really awesome if you have chess space or some type of sort of game editor you, that uh, you put it in that. In, in some sort of PGN file and then sent it to me that way because it's a little easier to open. Um, sometimes I could just copy paste the moves actually into chess space myself. Um, but if you want to make it easy on me, that is much appreciated. Now, uh, lastly, I just want to say thank you. I think it was really, really awesome and great just to see all the games that you guys have been playing. Um, I actually did uh, take a look at every single game that was sent. Um, so, I really do appreciate it, and I think that um, together we can really build a really awesome community. Um, and um, I just I thought it was really marvelous uh, that you guys are sort of sharing that passion for chess too. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to talk a little. I'm going to talk about this game. Um, I guess before I do that, um, I just mentioned uh, this is Sean underscore prize prize game, or that's at least his uh, username on YouTube. And um, I didn't have any criteria people were asking about. Even this guy was asking, like, oh, what about, you know, do you have criteria for the games? Like, is it something you wanted to see? Um, not really. Like, I thought most of the games were pretty interesting. Um, there were a lot of points in here where I thought uh, we, there'd be avenues for discussion. So hopefully I start and spark a discussion, and then you guys can run with it and learn what you may. So uh, this guy was black. Um, and uh, his opponent played c4. c4 is the English, uh, if you're not familiar with that. It's uh, a very flexible opening. And I remember when I was, uh, when I was uh, much younger and uh, playing it, um, or playing against it, rather, it was very annoying what setup to play for. Because if you played e5, um, a lot of times people were sort of uh, very happy to go into sort of like a reverse dragon type of style setup where white's actually quite comfortable. And then if you always if you played like e6, it always seemed to me that black was just a little bit passive playing sort of queen's gambit decline type of positions with d5 next. It's like d4, d5. It just seems like white got a decent move order. And then if you played knight f6 uh, and you wanted to go for a Grunfeld, the English is a very tricky beast. And after knight c3, g6, if you went g6, white can force you to play a king's Indian by playing e4, which actually cuts out the d5 move completely. Um, so there C4 is a very flexible opening, and I think that's sort of the merit of the move. Um, uh, I'm just going to call this guy Sean, uh, because I think that's better for short, and maybe that's the actual name. Sean played C6, um, and that sort of uh, is actually where I played a ton. It's If, if you're a Karakon player, you don't mind if your opponent goes E4, and uh, but you have to be willing to play a, some type of Slav, like a Slav or a Semi-Slav, and I think Sean was, because after knight c3, Sean went d5, and then uh, usually the move here would be d4, um, just sort of developing, but strangely enough, uh, his opponent actually played d3. And d3 is a, is a big mistake, because, uh, because uh, for a few, few reasons, actually. One, it actually offers this exchange on c4 for... Uh, and actually stops uh, white from castling. So actually, you could just play um, takes on uh, on c4, and then after d takes, play queen takes d1 and check. And taking with the knight is very awkward uh, going backward. But even after king takes d1, um, I would say black already has a quite a comfortable position because the king is is a little bit ex is a little bit vulnerable here. Not in any serious way yet, but really also uh, black has more of the squares defended uh, in his own camp than white. And so what I mean by that is I think the d4 square here looks particularly juicy 
So I can imagine black playing a move like, I don't know, like g6, and then playing bishop g7 and having real influence on this diagonal because white played c4 and knight c3 already. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I talk all the time about weaknesses, and that's where my head would be, g6, bishop g7, maybe putting a knight on c5, maybe pawn a5, and I think black is doing well here. Um, so the other thing uh, that this move allows is actually... Uh, d4. I mean, d4 would be a very interesting move, just sort of taking space in the middle, uh, asking the knight to do something that's a little bit uncomfortable. And even if the knight moves to the middle, uh, black could take more space by playing e5, and already I think black is slightly better, uh, because the knight could get harassed again with f5 later, and uh, it's just not a great position here. Now, uh, Sean did neither of these things and actually played bishop f5, and I think that's a little bit of a mistake uh, because you sort of let um, you let white off the hook a little bit. Um, still, black has a very reasonable position because d3 is a very tepid move to make. So c takes d5 is played, c takes d5, and now white played d4. And the really weird thing about this, actually, um, and I might, and if I say like weird move or bad move often. Um, I'm going to analyze this game like it was my own game. So I'm going to point out all the little nooks and crannies and resources, and uh, that's just how I think. I'm going to tell you exactly how I think. So the strange thing about playing d4 after playing d3 is you actually lost a tempo. You could have taken on d5 right away and then played d4, and it would have been like an exchange slav. Here, actually, by taking on d5 and then playing d4 in two moves, um, black is actually the one that has uh, uh, black is actually the one that's playing white essentially. Uh, black is the one playing this position that's nearly symmetrical a tempo up because it's black to move here. So for instance, you can imagine a move like Knight C6 being played, then black is actually used to tempo up. So it's really amazing that this was the way that white went. So uh, Sean played E6. I think that's a reasonable move developing. Uh, knight f6 and knight c6 were also options. And here, um, uh, a3 was played. And that's another mistake because it's very important to develop. Um, making flank moves with like a3 or h3 are just, they're like borderline unplayable before uh, you've developed. So even before move 10, playing those types of a3 or h3 moves are seldom good. In fact, the only line I can think of where you play a3 super early and it's justified is in uh, the classical Queen's Indian. And uh, I'm not sorry, not the Queen's Indian, the classical uh, uh, Nimzo Indian uh, for white. And uh, in that position, black's, white's actually getting a bishop pair for uh, the forced troubles, uh, which is not the case here. So, um, so yeah, you, these making these sort of Flank, pawn flank moves in particular are really ill-advised very early. And so black did well just to continue with the development. Bishop d6 makes a whole lot of sense. Um, also, again, knight f6 was an option, uh, developing the king side. Usually we say knights before bishops, but in fact bishop d6 is somewhat clever because it stops the bishop from going to f4. So I think that might have been Sean's idea. So if you play a move like knight f6, well then bishop f4... And now, I mean, black is still actually better, but really denying, allowing this bishop to get outside of the, pawn, uh, the chain clearly, getting outside the pawn chain before e3, makes a huge difference. Um, if you look at this position, uh, now after bishop d6, the dark squared bishop that white has doesn't have a square on f4 and g5 to go to. So pretty nice uh, nuance if that was Sean's intention. So knight f3, developing, finally. Uh, and knight d7, this move I don't like. Um, really no need to, I mean, knights are more active on the 6th rank than they are on the 7th rank, so unless there's a real defensive justification for putting it on the 7th rank, there's no reason to put a knight there, so that's the first thing. Second of all, um, you really want to develop your king side uh, as quickly as possible before your queen side, uh, and if you get your king side developed really quickly, then after castling, you can entertain going forward in the middle uh, or putting really good pressure somewhere else. And knight d7 doesn't advance that cause. So that's really the sort of the issue with knight d7. A better move, in my opinion, would have been knight f6, just developing. Um, and sure, yes, this might allow bishop g5, getting the bishop outside the chain. But 
black still retains a very healthy advantage here after just castling. Um, black is just a little bit up in the position, I would say. Um, so, sorry, uh, bishop d6, knight three. So after knight d7, g3, and this is actually a huge mistake um, for a few reasons. One, the pawn chain is symmetrical, um, and this bishop on f5 has a really amazing scope on this diagonal, on the h7 to b1 diagonal. So it really needs to be opposed. Um, that's, so that's really the issue. The bishop needs to go to e2 or maybe d3 to oppose the f5 bishop. Uh, the second thing is you always want the bishop to be doing something sort of on an active diagonal. And the bishop on g2 is pretty much shut down by uh, black's e6 and d5 pawns. Now, you do see bishop and channel bishops in other white openings, but a lot of the times what, what, the reason that's okay is because white has the c4 move that can put pressure on the d5 pawn and entertain the idea of opening the diagonal later, and that's why Fianchetti and the bishop is justified. In this position, the bishop on uh, f1 has no future at all on the g2 square. It's just an, it's a passive observer. And in fact, even if white was to break on e4, the consequence of d takes e4 would result in an isolated pawn for, um, for white on d4. So it's just really ill-advised putting the bishop there because there really isn't a useful pawn break on e4 that really gets something going. So that's g3 is a big mistake. And I guess lastly, if I had to add anything else, sometimes you might want to play bishop g5, right? We talked about knight gf6 and then white playing bishop g5. In the event that that actually happens, um, and let's see what actually happened here. Knight gf6 was played, so I can show that. If white played bishop g5 here, white didn't. You can't, after h6, now white can't retreat to h4. And in the previous lines, if the pawn was not on g3, white could go bishop h4, keep the pressure, and then if g5, just go bishop g3. But here, the bishop would have to take the knight, uh, and, then black, and then black would get the advantage that uh, we know is the bishop pair. Um, so really all around, it also hinders the... The potential of the G, of the dark squared bishop for white. So all those reasons make G3 G3 a bad move. Anyways, knight GF6 was played, bishop G2, rook C8. Again, uh, nothing particularly wrong with rook C8, but castling should be played first, without a doubt. Um, and and this is the type of micro mistake that uh, I think is important to point out because it might be just a move order thing. Maybe. Maybe rook c8 is where you want to put your rook anyway, but the fact of the matter is you want to maximize your flexibility, and castling is a move you have to do to get anything going. So you do what you have to do before you do what you want to do, but also you do what you have to do to maintain your flexibility because you might find something that you actually want to do later. So castling here just made more sense. Um, and uh, yeah, that's just me. So rook c8, castles, uh, white castled, okay, now castles, okay, and black is still doing fine. Uh, I just want to point out, though, that if, if black's knight was actually on c6 instead of d7, it would be even better. Uh, that's my belief. Now knight h4 is played. Uh, white, white at least recognizes that the bishop is valuable on f5 and probably should ought to be eradicated. And bishop g4 is an excellent move. Uh, you don't want to give that bishop so easily. And if uh, black tries, if white tries to secure that bishop, you want to make him work for it. So uh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, rook e1, uh, not a move I like. It does nothing to challenge the g4 bishop, but it also uh, uh, doesn't do anything to relieve the pin on the e2 pawn. So uh, yeah, not a great move. A6. Uh, I think that's an excellent move. It's one of these. Uh, it. I mean, it's not. It's one of these excellent prophylactic moves. It covers the b5 square. It maybe entertains playing b5 at some point. Um, I, I. I like ideas with like b5 and knight b6. Um, that looks really cool. Maybe getting the knight to c4. Um, if you look on the queen side, we see the pawns on a3 and b2. So as a consequence of that a3 move. Uh, the b3 square is really weak, and generally the light squares on uh, white's queen side are pretty weak if you look at b3 or a4 or c4. So 
B5 really does maybe crunch on those light squares, so nice touch. Knight of three back. Uh, the knight didn't have any purpose. Um, uh, yeah, makes a lot of sense. Maybe just to point out, too, h3 sometimes is an idea. And the point is that after bishop h5, g4, you challenge this, uh, this uh, knight on h4. There's some times, I don't know if here's the right way, but sometimes you actually, instead of moving this bishop back to g6 where it can be taken, you can make a move like knight e8 or move the knight away, and the queen's actually hitting the knight. And as a consequence, the knight has to move back, and then black can just retreat the bishop and actually preserve it. Um, because g takes h5, queen takes h4, not so desirable because the pawn structure is fairly ruined. Um, so sometimes that is a resource, uh, so keep out, out for that. But usually the knight, the black knight would be on c6, so the knight can retreat to d7. On e8, it's a, it's a touch awkward. But just a resource. So a6, knight f3, bishop e7. Not a move I like um, for a few reasons. One, you're sort of giving up that diagonal for no reason. Um, and so now bishop f4 becomes a really viable option for the bishop, which didn't really have a great diagonal to go to beforehand. Um, that's, that's the first issue. Um, the second issue is... It just sort of was a waste of time. I mean, uh, there were things that could have been done otherwise. You could have played. Think about thought about playing b5. You could have thought about playing queen e7 to connect your rooks. Um, those are things that sort of are. I would place at a premium above uh, bishop e7, which is a move that sort of defensive, but there's no reason for it. Um, I do want to point out though that moving the knight away from d7, so playing a move like knight. Knight somewhere else, maybe like knight b6, isn't entirely – is maybe a little ill-advised because maybe knight e5 is an option. So maybe, I don't know, um, maybe this would be a little bit annoying to deal with. Um, but, uh, but yeah, bishop b7 I don't like. Bishop d2 was played. Um, white's been very passive, and yeah, bishop f4 made a whole lot of sense here. Now that you seeded the diagonal um, – Again, normally when you're developing, just the longest bishop makes the most sense. Like, the longest diagonal for the bishop usually makes the most sense. Um, so, uh, bishop d2, um, okay, knight e4. And yeah, knight e4 I also don't like, because here, again, you're, you have a little bit more flexibility, uh, black does in the position. And knight e4 just resolves, allows white to trade some pieces that were really not doing so hot. And furthermore, it gives the bishop on g2 hope, hope that it might someday have influence on this diagonal. Before this knight e4 move, the bishop on g2 was doing absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing. And in fact, I would have probably, again, entertained a move like b5 as an option, um, but also maybe would have thought about just h6, because I really would like the bishop to be able to go to the h7 I would like the bishop to go back to f5 sometimes without not being without being harassed by knight h4. And now, by playing h6, I always have the h7 square for the bishop to stay on that diagonal if I feel like. So, um, yeah, I think h6 or b5 I would have played. So, knight e4, and now white jumps at the opportunity. Knight takes e4, d takes e4. Because now the bishop on g2, there's at least hope that it has some counterplay. So, again, black is still doing very well here, but I'm just pointing that out. So now, because now the knight actually doesn't have any squares, so maybe that was the motivation, is that you were going for this knight e5, knight takes e5, d takes e5 structure that actually happened. But I would argue here that white has better chances than he did uh a few moves ago. Um, here, at least, the white bishop's attacking something where it had no prospects of attacking something before. Um, and it's a relatively symmetrical position, so maybe uh, white can hope for something. Uh, but the issue real still remains, uh, black is slightly ahead in development because the rook is already on the C file, and black's just a little bit more active, has more potential in the position. So here, black played bishop f5, that makes a whole lot of sense, defending the e4 pawn. And actually, you'd actually prefer to have the bishop on f5 to the bishop on g2 still. 
um, because the Bishwan F5 is just a little bit more. I don't know. It just it's just controlling more. Uh, it's it's I, it's of course defending the E4 pawn, but Black still has the advantage in space, and again a little bit quicker to the punch, um, a little bit better placed pieces. I mean the Bishwan E7 is better placed than the Bishwan D2. Again, the rooks are better placed. The rook on e1 is doing absolutely nothing. So, yeah, I think black's still a little better. Um, but definitely not as bad as before uh, for white. And here white played rook c1. Uh, I guess trying to trade some pieces, liquidate a little bit. Um, I don't think that was great. I think it was really imperative that black, or that white closed off the file somehow uh, for the rook. Um, and I probably would have considered playing bishop c3. I think that was would have been an effective way for 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 white to entertain some some trades and defend the e5 pawn and sort of keep everything protected. Um, although I'm looking at it now, and maybe that's not the best way. Maybe I don't know. It's tough to say because you can't really allow e3. E3 would be a very annoying resource. So maybe it's actually not the best way. It's tough to say. Not in this position because e3 here would not be good because queen takes d8 check queen takes d8 e takes f2 king takes rook takes and actually the b7 pawn is hanging so white would actually be better here but I don't know you'd have to watch out for this e3 break at some point so black could maybe just move the queen and then threaten this e3 move so I don't know but I think I think rook c1 is a little bit tame. And not so great because black has the opportunity to control, still control the C file with a rook, uh, because um, he's just closer to getting everything connected. And so here, uh, black played queen d7, but I wouldn't have gone for that. I think queen d7 is a little bit slow and doesn't threaten anything. You do want your rooks connected, so that's that's of merit. But I would have considered queen b6, which connects the rooks protects b7, and attacks b2 simultaneously, and also puts a really, really uh, wary eye on the, or threatening eye on the f2 pawn. So maybe bishop c5 is in the air. Again, if bishop c3, maybe e3 is in the air. Um, they're just all sorts of threats that become possible with the queen on b6. So that's sort of where I would have gone. So queen d7 bishop a5. Uh, white definitely need to trade some pieces and relieve the pressure. I don't, I'm not sure bishop a5 was the right way to do that. Again, I probably, I think probably bishop c3 would have been more accurate. Um, just sort of uh, blocking one file from the rook for the time being, temporarily, and then trying to get, trying to sort of get some control on the other one. Um, and note that at some point, bishop takes a3 might become a tactic. So if like queen takes d1 and then rook to c takes d1, bishop takes a3 would probably be a bit of an oversight because of this This pawn would be overworked. So that's a tactic that white has to look out for. But here, uh, white can take with the other rook and, and would be okay. So white, black would probably have to do something else like, I don't know, like playing rook d8 or maybe even moving the queen. Um, somewhere and getting some traction there, but at least white gets some sort of tempo to sort of stabilize because it is black that's still a little bit ahead. So, okay, so what happened? So bishops a5 was played, and then black played queen d5, and that's actually a pretty good move. Um, uh, I don't have too much to complain about there. Um, it's uh, it, it does sort of control the file. It attacks the bishop on a5. Um, it also attacks the pawn on e5. It's a pretty cool move to make, and you're also trying to um, uh, to sort of fix your pawn structure if, if white takes the queen. But also, it, it allows black to control the d file still and not see the d file. It's funny because we looked at um, the vid my previous video where I showed this rook b3 idea preserving the B file in another game. Um, this is sort of similar in a way. You're sort of preserving the file for the time being by protecting a heavy piece with the pawn. So maybe that's a theme that can be talked about further, but pretty interesting. I actually probably still wouldn't have gone queen d5, 
simple I mean simply because I think maybe Queen B5 might have even been stronger. The point is that you hit b2, you attack a5, you're also attacking e5, and I only see bishop c3 as a move, actually. Um, and the problem with bishop c3 is it actually runs into rook d8, and now all of a sudden uh, white's queen is just completely lacking squares. Uh, queen c2, the only legal square to move the queen without losing it, runs into e3, which would just be devastating uncovering the queen and, the, and of course, threatening he takes f2 check and just opening up uh, just opening up the position in black's favor. So I think queen b5 actually would have been super strong and perhaps would have just uh, maybe just sealed the deal, actually, because um, I'm not finding any real proper response to it. Um, so queen b5, I think, was uh, a better move. And again, it so many, so many times, the better move is the one that's just more flexible or just has more options. So you can see with queen b5, you're just doing more stuff. And a lot of times you want to make try to make moves that keep yourself flexible and not committal. Um, although I've, it's rare that I've passed up on a queen trade, um, to be honest, because end games, queenless mill games are sort of my wheelhouse. So anyways, uh, you did play queen b5. Uh, I start queen b5. And white said, okay, cool, uh, queen takes d1. That's probably not the best move, but um, okay, the bishop was attacked, so there was not so much that could be done about it. Um, and yeah, so queen takes d5, e takes d5, and it's clear that black is still better because black has a healthier pawn structure, and this bishop on g2 is still shut out of the game uh, once again. Um, so rook c7. Interesting move, but not correct, because it just seeds the file. Um, if you go back here, uh, again, it's another one of these things where both sides are jockeying for the file, and you need to sort of, it's like a question of who wins it. Um, and essentially, I think the only move that, I think black, white has to sort of maintain this file, and the only move to do that is to play bishop d2, uh, just to play rook takes c8, rook, rook takes c8, and then rook c1 next. And maybe... Maybe white can try to play for a draw by holding somehow, but it's still going to be very difficult because this bishop on g2 is so bad blocked out of the game, and you can't really survive blocked out of the game for too long. Um, so, yeah, rook c7 just seeds the file right away. So rook takes c7, bishop takes c7, rook c8, and this was excellent, excellent move. You decide to take the file, and of course we can realize right now that rook c1 would just fail to bishop d8, pinning. So um, really, really, this is already seems to be in a losing position because uh, the bishop on g2 is still shut out and uh, the rook can infiltrate. So bishop a5 was played. That was a bit puzzling to me. Um, I thought bishop d6 was the only move to sort of entertain fighting. Um, here still, black is still much better. Um, uh, likely just winning, actually. But at least black can entertain fight. White can entertain making you think about something here because bishop a5 just concedes the file without counterplay. <coughs> Excuse me. And here I think you really missed a shot, Sean. Really missed a shot. And uh, instructive. Because here you played bishop c5. And I don't know if it's hope chess. Maybe you're hoping for rook c1. Maybe you're looking at e3. Um, but you just won this lovely file for your rook, and you should, you ought to, uh, to go to it. Uh, it's really imperative that you go to it, and it actually just wins the game. Rook c2 attacks the b2 pawn and takes control of the second rank. And if you, if we all know, um, if we've, uh, if we've gone to, uh, if we learned chess in the early stages, right, you take control of this, a rook on the second or seventh rank is devastating. And it's still true in the endgame. Um, and really the problem is that there's no efficient way to defend this b-pawn. If you play a move like rook b1 while you hang the e2 pawn, right? Uh, that's no good. Um, if you play bishop c3, we actually have this really tricky tactic we talked about a little bit before. Bishop takes a3, which just wins a pawn and the game, um, actually, because uh, uh, the rook on... Uh, 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 after b takes a3, uh, the bishop is hanging, and uh, rook takes c3 just wins. Um, and here, there's, there's just no way that 
kept waking out at us. And if, uh, what's the other thing I was looking at? Yeah, and then if white pushes the pawn, so let's say b3, uh, then the a3 pawn hangs. Um, and if white plays b4, this bishop is shut out uh, temporarily, um, but, uh, but it's just no good. It's really, this rook is just too active. And um, uh, yeah, you have a host of options. You could play d4 if you're feeling super aggressive and just go for d3 and d2. Um, you can even slow play it with playing like h6 if you feel like you're scared of getting back rank checkmate. You could just play h6 and, and, and then go about your business because uh, really uh, white's just uh, lacking activity. Maybe even g5 is a better way of getting that activity uh, clamping down. You could play g4 and clamp down on that bishop on g2 even further. Um, I guess the last thing I would say about rook c2 that makes it so strong is rook d1. Uh, maybe this is what you you looked at. You saw rook d1 and you saw, well, the d5 pawn is hanging, the d5 pawn is hanging. Well, the issue with that is that you can just play bishop e6 defending the d5 pawn. And you're still attacking e2 and, and b2 because the rook just moved away from the e2 pawn. And now, here's the real important resource. Rook d2, which you would think covers the pawns, it does, but it runs into rook c1 check, which is really a mating problem because after bishop f1, there's bishop f h3. Um, and so, really, there's a back rank issue as well uh, if white tries to cover the pawns in an artificial way. So, yeah, when you when you see an opportunity, you might not have calculated all those lines. And to be frank, I didn't calculate those lines either when I so when I was looking. Um, it just, just was on intuition, essentially. If you have the opportunity to have a rook go to the second or seventh rank, you do it. You do it almost without hesitation because it, it just must be good. Um, and that's something that you just get with more experience. So bishop c5 lets white off the hook a little bit, and white played e3. Um, e3 is also, I mean, it sort of blunts your bishop for the time being, and so white can actually entertain get, getting some counterplay here. Um, black is still much better, though. Um, and so uh, you played d4. Um, that's not a move I would have played, simply because, again, the c file is where it's at. And I don't want to give this bishop on g2 more scope. So instead of d4, I would have maybe gone, I don't know, bishop, bishop e7 back, honestly, um, just to get my rook back to c2. It's that big of a deal, honestly. Um, so, yeah. But after d4, uh, bishop d2, um, you can't complain too much because he didn't take your pawn and you have massive activity, uh, massive activity. And now you can think about playing d3 if you want. Uh, maybe you think about uh, retreating the bishop and infiltrating on the c-file still. I don't know. So d3 you played. Um, just a snapshot. I don't know if d takes e3 or d3 is better. Um, honestly, to my eye, d takes e3 looks a little bit better. Um simply because bishop takes e3 runs into the same problem if they take with the rook again. There's this rook c1 idea and then bishop h3, uh, and this back rank issue is just constant. So because of this d takes, uh, this this uh, this back rank issue, white has to play f takes e3, and then again, these double pawns are really ugly. And you don't even have to go for it right away. It's more important to keep the active c file. So I would actually just go... Uh, bishop e7 again, and just try to get in rook c2. Uh, because again, here, bishop c3 fails to bishop takes a3, um, which just wins a pawn. Um, so it's again, these themes are constantly coming up, but it's really also has to do with your activity being a lot greater than white, so these opportunities come. So, all right. Um, maybe I'm talking too much. So d3... Rook c1, yeah, this does allow whites uh, some counterplay. Rook c7, it makes sense. You can't play, uh, white was threatening b4, and you didn't want to lose the e4 pawn for trading rooks. Um, b4 played now. Um, 
I wonder if B4 was the way to go, actually. I don't like B4. I don't like White's, I don't like White's B4. Uh, but anyways, uh, Bishop B6, Rook takes, Bishop takes. And yeah, you have a really great position still, um, winning position still, because you're, this E5 pawn is really hard to defend. And, and yeah, the bishop on G2 is still in a cage. Um, and so, yeah, you have a great position. Um, F4 was played here, and uh, F4 I didn't like at all, at, at all. Um, because, of course, you could you could play en passant, which you did. But I'm also wondering if you could keep the bishop just caged up and win uh, and win another way. Um, okay, it doesn't... I was wondering if you could just play like a move like h5 and then just lock the bishop up. But I guess if h3 would be played and he'd, and he'd force through g4. So, no, it's probably best to play en passant. And actually, it's definitely best to play en passant. So, good for you for playing en passant. Bishop takes f3. And now, b6. Good move. Just protect your pawn. Um, makes a lot of sense to do that. Uh, yeah. But I'm wondering now if white is so much worse, because if you take the e5 pawn, he takes your b7 pawn, right? And then maybe white's actually better. And after b6, I was wary about bishop b7. Um, he played bishop c3, um, defending a doubled pawn, which makes no sense to me at all. And I'm wondering if bishop b7 is actually better at all. Because after bishop b7, you can't really defend everything. I mean, if you play a5, um, surely he'll take, and then you take. And then you can't take the e5 pawn and defend the a5 pawn. So I'm only actually a little bit unsure about the consequences of this endgame. Um, I'd have to actually start calculating here rather than making snap judgments. Um, of course, I don't think you, I don't think you can lose, but I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely sure it's winning. Um, hmm. I wonder. No, actually, I changed my mind. It's winning. Uh, you could play bishop takes e5. Um, actually, if uh... oh no, it's white to move. All right, well, let me make a dummy move. Let's say bishop g2 is played. Uh, you can actually take on e5, because after bishop takes a5, there's bishop b2, which attacks the a3 pawn. And uh, after defending it with like a move like uh, bishop b4, um, then there's bishop c1, which supports the advance of the, um, uh, the d-pawn, and it's just decisive, like a king f2, d2, king, king e2. Then there's like bishop c2, uh, sorry, not bishop c2, bishop g4, um, check, which would result in like takes, 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 and then d1 queen. So actually, if, if white makes a dummy move, then you definitely are winning. So I think white would have to go a4 to ensure that you don't have this resource to pick up to get a tempo on the a3 pawn. Um, and then, yeah, here I'm not so sure if you're winning, actually. Not so sure. Uh... Because white, yeah, I mean, it's tough. I mean, white, for starters, could just go bishop c3 uh, and defend it. Um, and taking now doesn't yield the same sort of um, sort of advantage, because you can't just get around to, to pushing d2 to supporting that push very easily. Like, if you go bishop b2, there's king f2, and if bishop c1... Um, I thought there was king e1, but no, there's actually still... Uh, D2 check, so maybe black is still winning or better. I don't know. Um, it's a l the 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 lines need to be calculated. No, that's let's leave it at that. I'll be my my cop out. The lines will need to be calculated, um, and I'm not going to do that, that as deeply right now. So yeah, um, wow, that was long winded. So en passant, bishop takes b6. Bishop c3 is played just defending that pawn, and yeah, without getting real counterplay on the a6 pawn, you just waltz over to e5 and pick it up, right? So, um, yeah. King f8 makes sense to me. Uh, king f1, king e7, bishop d5. Um, interesting, uh, stopping the king from, uh, from coming to e6 temporarily. 
But I actually don't know how great it is long term because it essentially just uh, – I don't know. It, 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 I don't think the bishop can stay there. And uh, yeah, if it can't stay there, that's going to be a problem. Uh, bishop g4 was played, but I'm even wondering if uh, – I don't know. I was wondering if a move like bishop e6 could be played and is actually much stronger because the point is that if you take – this is just a losing endgame because you're picking up the e5 pawn too quickly and then your king supports e4. Um, in fact, you don't even have to pick up the e5 pawn because it's doubled, so you can actually just waltz your king in. And you can play g6 first so that he doesn't have this e6 resource, and then waltz your king into c4. Like, if like king f2, uh, or I guess king at e1 is better. Um, well, yeah, actually just, I don't know. What am I saying? Yeah, this has to be winning for you, like king d5, and then like, if king d2, you have like king, king e4, and yeah, I don't believe this can be holdable. Um, but, um, but yeah, what I was really getting at is that if bishop e4 is played, um, you can actually play bishop c4, which protects the d3 pawn and uh, prepares for the king march to e6 still, and threatens d2 discovery check. So now king e1 has to be played. And after king e6, uh, you're taking on e5. Uh, note that bishop takes h7 would be ill-advised because of g6, just uh, trapping the uh, h7 bishop. So that was the point. Um, I don't know, maybe h4 is a resource here. No, just bishop takes e5. It's sufficient. And if takes h5, there's king... Yeah, this doesn't work. You can just take it if you want. Um, or maybe you could play king f6, actually. Yeah, then you just trap the bishop, actually. You could just trap the bishop. Because if h6, holding the bishop in place, you have king g5. And you're actually still securing the, the pawn uh, and the bishop's trap. So, yeah. So bishop c4 is maybe... Bishop e6, I thought, maybe is an idea. Um, anyway, so king e7, bishop d5, bishop g4, king e1. These moves are fairly forced. I mean, white needs to get over to the d-pawn. Bishop e6 now, so you realize that you need to make progress that way to do anything. Um, and now bishop takes e6, and my oh my, I, you're fortunate here. Because if he just plays bishop e4, uh, for instance, I, I just, I can't imagine, uh, I mean, he's attacking h7 and, and d3, and... If you play bishop c4 now to preserve that pawn, well, now now white has some options. Uh, I mean, for starters, uh, e6 is a move now, hitting g7. And if you play a move like f6, uh, white can just take this pawn without fearing the bishop getting trapped. And, yeah, this tactical resource is pretty annoying because if uh, king takes e6, there's bishop takes g7, um, which just ruins your pawn structure completely. And now stills attacking h7, and king d2 is a threat. So bishop c4 doesn't have the same effect anymore now that the king isn't on f1 and there aren't these discovery check threats that were before in d2. So, yeah, uh, a little bit fortunate. So bishop b6, you're fortunate he took. And after king takes king d2, yeah, you need to take on e5, right? So bishop takes e5, and then there's this pawn in game which arises, which instinctually, to me, should just be much better for you because you have two pawn islands and white has three as a consequence of having the isolated e-pawn. And so just from a from that perspective, the usually the, the pawn structure that's healthier in a pawn endgame of any kind really is the one that's is the, is the side as the upper hand. And after bishop takes, king takes, king takes d3, it just appeared to me that White is uh, that black is the one with the upper hand because of this advantage in uh, in uh, in pawn structure. Even in this end game, it's this. It's also the advantage in space. Black has more control of the board right now, right? Because black is controlling ranks four to eight with the king, and white only has the back three ranks. So here you played b5, and I don't love that move because it doesn't actually do anything to sort of. Uh, the king couldn't go further anyway on the queen side. Like king c4, uh, if, if, if let's say like my move would have been f5. 
And the reason for that is it, it stops e4, and it also stops other pawn breaks like g4. And again, white can't actually make progress on the queen side. Like at king c4, white's king still can't break through. Like white, white, as long as the king's on e5, white literally cannot break through here. In fact, even if it's on e4, white can only break through by playing a4 and a5, which takes time. So I don't think b5 was the best one. I think f5 would have been really great. Um, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, maybe, maybe It doesn't become a little bit tricky because if king c4, then g5, and then a4, and then... Ugh, pawn end games are the worst, honestly. But I think you're faster. Like it just intu intuitively, it appears to me that you're faster. Like maybe a5. That's the only way to break through, right? If you play b5, there's just a5, and then that's just shutting out the king. And then you wait to take the pawn until the king has moved back. So, but a5 takes takes king takes king c5 f4. Yeah, this just looks way too slow. Way way too slow. So that was what my intuition was telling me. And f5 just sort of stops, oh sorry, you play b5, but f5 just stops all of white's pawn breaks in the tracks. So, uh, b5, g4, and yeah, now he sort of wise, wises up to that a little bit, um, but uh, yeah, f5, um, but I think even now f5 might be strong, I don't know, because now you might have the opportunity to get the outside passer. Oh, no, no, it's not. Maybe takes, takes, king, d4, and now the king gets in. No. All right, so f5. See, I, may, I don't... I, I have a hunch that black may be still fine here, but definitely something was spoiled. So g4, g6. Ooh, a little bit of a risky move, because when you play g6, you don't actually... You invite this g5 move, and now you can't break with your pawns on their, on their own without the support of the king. And I'm wondering if king f5, king d4, this might be a little uncomfortable. Um, I don't know. Now it's looking a bit dicey because it takes some time for you to... We have to win another pawn to start pushing your own. So g6 just fundamentally doesn't look too hot to me because after g5, um, you just... One pawn essentially controls three. And so that's a little bit risky. So g6, h4, he doesn't play it, h6 e4, king f4, and now it just becomes this race where he essentially, I think, blundered just how quickly you would be queening. And so um, you ought to win this game. Um, I was really shocked here, by the way, after king f8, that you just don't play queen f6 check. It's sort of this classic idea. You can, The king has to go to e8 to block the pawn, and then you just bring your king over. And then if they try to uh, queen again, you get to give another check. And then uh, if they go here, trying to queen, you go here. And then at king d8, you give another check. And eventually you keep attacking the pawn in a way. You check, you check, 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 and then attack a pawn in the way, in the way so that king ha the king has to go in front of the pawn. And then you're fine. So, um, and then you can get on with your own business. And in fact, here you could actually just go king f8. And actually just, you don't even have to make a second queen. You can just go for mate because your your king is so close. But um, but yeah, unless it's an F or a, unless, it, unless it's a F pawn, a rook pawn or a F or C pawn, there aren't any stalemating tricks either. And actually there aren't any stalemating tricks, period, because white has extra material on the board. So yeah, knowing that technique is important when a pawn is really far up the board and you need to stop it. Um, because what you wound up doing is you sacked your queen and then you were unsure about the consequences of, of an actual, um, of an actual, another queen, another pawn race, or, or you're unsure of the consequences of queen versus two pawns. And so after queen, you, you took and rushed, but you were really nervous and you communicated that while you were down on time here, after queen F1 check, um, you... You had more game notation, but you said you actually accepted a draw here. And um, it's, I know it's scary, particularly if, you know, you're, you, you're just like, I don't know if my king can get over in time. I don't know if my queen will be able to stop the pawns on their own. Um, but I think two things about that draw, if it did indeed happen. Firstly, um, 
as with the queen, right, you always have perpetual check. So even if you're unsure of the consequences, you can always make a draw later. And second of all, I'm really against uh, agreeing to draws in almost any scenario um, because it sort of gets in the way of your development as a chess player. And so if you really want to get better, you, you ought to play everything out no matter the consequence because ultimately your nerves will become stronger and, um, and you'll just be better at playing when there's pressure and playing when there's stakes and all that good stuff. Um, and, uh, hey, I mean, if you really want to consider chess a sport, um, as many chess players do, then, uh, you can't just, you know, end the game like that, so. But, um, but yeah, uh, this is pretty, uh, it's not so difficult to stop the pawns, um, because, uh, you can constantly harass the king and then it has to get in front of them. So, um, in fact, let's just say king, uh, sorry, let's say king c6 for the sake of argument. Uh, then you just move your, you can, you can give a check, then the king, what, if it goes over here, goes to the deep file, it can't actually protect him, so it has to go to b6, then you just bring your king over, then you just bring your king over, um, it's just, there's just not enough time to push the pawns, and in fact here, I mean, just, there's just king c6, and now this king is paralyzed, um, and, uh, well, if b7, there's mate, and if a6, I mean, sorry, if there's a4, there's a checkmate as well. So if it was indeed a draw after this position with queen f1 check on the board, um, and again, you also cited time. Uh, time trouble to me also is an excuse to agree to a draw. Play things out. You will be all the better for it. So, yeah. So I guess that's that. That was a really long-winded explanation, but it was... Uh, uh, in a long analysis, but it, hey, it was a long game, and um, I hope you guys, uh, I mean, even if you're maybe, uh, uh, I hope you guys learned something from this game, even if it wasn't yours, I think there was a lot of really important moments, um, and, uh, and uh, yeah, don't take draws, and um, yeah, I'm really, uh, I think this, this will be an interesting series, and um, uh, definitely, um, I would say if you're interested in having games looked at, um, submit games through my email, and then I'm going to pour over games and then just choose one um, every week. I think I might do this once or twice a week. So thank you for watching, and take care.